Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Lavanya, consultant in Bangalore Skullbase Institute and Bangalore ENT Institute. Uh, without further delay, we'll just start off. People can join along as they come. Um, so today's topic will be otosclerosis, symptomatology, and management. So we'll be going through certain basics of otosclerosis, including etiology, pathophysiology, just for the benefit of all the young surgeons and postgraduates who might be attending. And then we will go in detail about the management, symptomatology, and management of the complications. So what is otosclerosis? Otosclerosis is a disease of altered bone metabolism. And this altered bone metabolism is a localized phenomena only to the otic capsule. So only the end control bone of the otic capsule is affected in this deranged bone metabolism and otosclerosis. So this process of disordered resorption and there is deposition. So it's present clinically. So the people who present to us in the general population with symptoms of otosclerosis account for around 0.3 to 0.5%. But histologically, if you study the, those of the temporal bones, those yield percentages up to 12%. And in different races, the percentages differ. So it is more prevalent in Caucasians and even to some extent in Indians. But in certain populations like the African populations, and the blacks generally it is much less in percentage and also gender wise it is more common in female than male up to almost twice and the age of onset generally involves from sector to the fourth decade of life so coming to the etiology so the there are four main categories here so one is the autoimmune uh, and one is the measles, the sex hormones, and the disorder, disordered bone metabolism. So if you look at autoimmune disease, generally, it, in certain studies, patients have shown to have antibodies to type 2 collagen are a closely related anti, antibodies to collagen that is type 9. So and in certain animal studies, if these antigens were introduced into those animals, they were pro, and the antibodies developed, they were prone to develop autosclerosis. But it is not confirmatory and it is not present in all patients who present with otosclerosis. The same thing with measles. So one of the theories is that with increase in the vaccination of measles, the percentage of otosclerosis in certain populations came down. But there's a contradictory argument that when we look at uh, the African continent, though the number of otosclerosis patients uh, is very less, the measles uh, is more common in, the, uh, in these populations. So this also doesn't always really hold up. But for certain people, so anti-measles virus, uh, that is CD46, has been found in the foot plate of these patients. So that is one of the reasons we think measles could still be related. So uh, when we look at the hormones, generally, we implicate that the sex hormones can be involved because the condition is more common in female. And over 50% of the patients who present with otosclerosis during the pregnancy period started having the symptoms at the start of the pregnancy. So there seems to be certain relationship with the female population as well as with the hormone. So though we don't know exactly which hormone or what pathway is implicated in this process, but since it is more common with female and is related more commonly with pregnancy, we assume there is a relation. So other one is the disturbed bone metabolism. So what happens is in the embryological process, there are certain cell nests. So cartilaginous cell rests are present in the otic capsule. If these get reactivated as a secondary process, then the remodeling process starts again. So that could be one of the starting points of otosclerosis in certain people. So looking at the pathology, so if we look at the pathology, so there are two ligands. One is the rank L and the rank. So as we know, osteoblast and there are osteoclastic cells. Osteoclastic cells are responsible for bone resorption. Osteoblasts are responsible for bone deposition. So these rank L and rank activate these osteoclast and osteoblast cells and lead to differentiation and mature osteoclast, which leads to resorption. But there is one more uh, 
there is one more uh, OPG that is osteoprotectin. So this come acts as a competitive inhibitor with the rank and the rank L. So when this acts as a competitive inhibitor, if this goes and binds with rank L and rank, then these in turn cannot activate the osteoclast and then cannot lead to mature osteoclast. So in turn, bone resorption and bone deposition process will be reduced. So one of the theories is that osteoprotegrin or OPG is high in amount in the perilymph. So it keeps getting circulated along the OT capsule. Normal remodeling of the OT capsule is much slower. That is, if a normal other bones remodulate up to 10%, the remodeling process of the OT capsule is only up to 2%. So OPG is known to be the reason why this is there. So any so any disturbance, so all the other etiologies we talked about could be what causes the disturbance in OPG, though we don't know exactly what is the pathway. So if the amount of OPG is different, then this process can be disturbed and the pathology of photosclerosis can start. So looking at histopathology, so globuli enterosi is a loci of the earliest lesions. So generally, it is characterized by bone resorption, new bone formation by the osteoblast, vascular proliferation, and connective tissue formation. So along with bone resorption and bone formation, there is increase in the vascular uh, proliferation. That is why those reddish shoes that we keep talking about in autosclerosis are also seen. So these can be divided into four stages. One is first starting with stage one, the resorption of enchondral bone around the blood vessels. So then comes the perivascular space enlargement, which then leads to enzymatic action and demineralization. After this process is com uh, completed, then the deposition of an immature bone first starts and then it's sclerosis. Okay, so this process continues. So these are the four different stages of the pathology. And you look at the histopathology of autosclerosis. So what is blue mantle cells? So if we take the histopathological cuts and if we stain them, the autosclerotic foci take up the basophilic stain. So these basophilic stain appear extremely blue. So that is why these autosclerotic focus are known as the blue mantle cells. So the two phases of the disease, one is the active phase and one is the mature phase. So the active phase is where the bone resorption and the uh, vascular proliferation is taking place. So that is also known as the spongiosis. The mature phase is the second phase basically where there is bone deposition and sclerosis. It's also known as the, scleros the sclerotic phase. So if you look at what happens in the disease, so whatever the etiologies we discussed along with the histopathology and pathology, replace the normal bone that is there by a spongy bone. So this in turn causes immobilization of the stapes foot plate. Once the stapes foot plate is immobilized, obviously we know that it is an important part of disruption of the sound transmission. So that sound transmission is interrupted and there is hearing loss. So that is when the patients come to us. So we quickly go through the types of photosclerosis. Uh, we'll, uh, one is the clinical and the other uh, classification is the histological. We'll focus on the clinical classification. So clinically, if the autosclerosis up, uh, affects only the stapes, then it is stapedial. If it affects the cochlea, then it is cochlear type of photosclerosis, but it affects both the stapes and the cochlea, then it is mixed type of photosclerosis. And uh, there are different sites or the focus where it is more commonly seen. So, for example, if we take the uh, oval window area, then anterior to the oval window is where 80 to 90 percent of the foci of autosclerosis is seen. So, in around less than uh, 15 percent of the patients, it can be seen around the round window niche, and the other areas are very small in percentage. So if you look posterior to the round window, it can also involve the internal auditory canal. The posterior wall is more commonly involved when it involves the internal auditory canal. It can also affect the cochlear aqueduct in very rare cases or the semicircular canals. So in certain uh, cases, which is also known as the biscuit type of photosclerosis, the autosclerotic foci is present only within the stapedial foot plate. Okay, so the diagram shows the different uh, autosclerotic foci, that is the anterior, posterior, circum uh, circumferential biscuit as well as. Okay, 
So uh, there are a few other terms that we'll include here. One is the what is far advanced otosclerosis. So one second. Yeah. So no measurable if in far advanced otosclerosis, basically the air conduction is really, really poor. So air conduction is nothing better than 95 decibel loss and bone conduction 55 to 60 decibel loss, but at least uh, but at one frequency only. But uh, if you look at what is malignant or uh, also known as obliterative otosclerosis, in a severe active otosclerosis involving oval round window, initially with mixed hearing loss, progressing to profound sensory hearing loss. So generally, it starts with involving only the oval window, but it can when it is obliterative or malignant otosclerosis, the focus can be many and progress. So in that case, if they also involve the round window, then the hearing loss can be very severe and profound. So that time it can also cause sensineural hearing loss. Then what is cavitating otosclerosis? So within these foci of otosclerosis, large cavities can certain, sometimes form. So these, if they include the endosteum of the scalar tympani, then they can have a third window effect because of this connection. So what why is this important? So in these conditions where there's cavitating type of photosclerosis, there are two important things. One is even after a successful uh, successful stapes surgery, they can still be persistent airborne conduction gap. And the other one is if the space, the cavity space is communicating with the CSF space in the internal auditory canal commonly, then there can be a CSF gush in these cases. So it's important for us to know this particular phenomena so that we'll be prepared when we take these patients up for surgery. So we'll move on to symptomatology. So generally, the patients present to us with gradual onset with slow progression over several years. So gradual onset hearing loss will be there and it will only slowly progress over many years. So patients initially might ignore their symptoms and only when it reaches certain stage where it is causing difficulty in their day-to-day -day life, generally do they present to us. Generally, these are women in their third or fourth decade of life with positive family history. And generally, they, it involves both the, both the sides by the time they come to us. In almost 70% of the individuals who have otosclerosis, uh, it is bilateral. And uh, over 70% of the patients when they present to us also have tinnitus. So vestibular symptoms are less common in uh, otosclerotic patients. So it is seen in less than, 20, uh, less than 30 percent of the patients. So why does con so we know this conductive hearing loss, vestibular uh, symptoms, and sensorineural hearing loss. So why does conductive hearing loss occur in otosclerosis? So when there is otosclerotic foci and the bone uh, remodeling is happening, there's ankylosis of the annular ligament, especially if the posterior part of the annular ligament is involved, then the hearing defect increases. That is, the, uh, depending on the degree of the ankylosis of the posterior part of the annular ligament, the AB gap can go up to greater than 30 decibels. But AB gap alone is not a reliable predictor of the degree of ankylosis, mainly because there are coexisting conditions which can change the uh, degree of ankylosis and the degree of AB gap. So, for example, if there was fixation of ankles or malleus, if there was cavitating otosclerosis, or if there was complete obstruction of the round window niche. So these conditions, even if there is a mild degree of ankylosis of the annular ligament, can still give a big AB gap or also have a sensorineural component involved along with it. So that is why the AB gap is not a reliable predictor of the degree of ankylosis. So if you look at sensorineural hearing loss, so otosclerotic involvement of the endosteum. So there are many reasons why sensorineural hearing loss happens. So previously it was thought that toxic metabolic uh, injury to the neuroepithelium, that can be vascular compromise or direct extension of the otosclerotic foci into cochlea. So if the cochlear otosclerosis is there, yes, there can be sensorineural hearing loss. But even if there is no cochlear otosclerosis and sometimes there can be sensorineural hearing loss. But in most of the studies, it was shown that the cochlea, the inner hair cells, the outer hair cells, the neural uh, elements of the inner ear are not affected to a great extent for those sensorineural hearing losses to be there. So one of the involvement that they see was the endosteum 
if it is involved, there can be hyalinization and atrophy of the spiral ligament. So if the spiral ligament hyalinization is there, then in those patients, all of them had sensineural hearing loss. But none of them is proven to a large extent. These are the different theories that was previously thought of. But right now, one of the more prominent theories is the otos otosclerotic involvement of the endosteum, which leads to hyalinization and atrophy of the spiral ligament in those patients we can have sensineural hearing loss. So we look at vestibular symptoms, it's seen in only around 10 to 30% of the patients. So this is generally attributed to the G degeneration of the scarpas ganglion. Uh, but not only that, if the patient has associated diseases like Meniere disease, or if the otosclerosis extremely rarely involves the vestibular aqueduct, then in those patients also, that patients can ex uh, experience vestibular symptoms. Uh, we'll move on to diagnosis. So when we look at diagnosis, we look at first the clinical, then the audiological, and then the radiological examination to arrive at the final diagnosis. So clinical, the main thing that we depend on at otoscopy and then probably new otoscopy. So otoscopy, as we all know, we use the otoscope or auto microscope to look at the tympanic membrane and the complaints of the tympanic membrane with new otoscopy. So generally, there is not much change that is seen with otoscopy. Majority of the time, tympanic membrane appears normal, except foreign conditions where in some patients, if there is active otosclerotic foci at the time of presentation, even in them, only around 10% of the patients can have this condition where you can see a reddish hue or a pinkish hue, also known as the flamingo pink or the short sign. So this is mainly because of the increased vascularization that is seen around the area of the promontory because of the active foci. So if the disease is inactive or in the sclerotic phase, this will not be seen. Even in the active phase, this is not seen in all percentage of the patients. So only around 10% of the patients who present to us will have the short sign as positive. So the next is the audiological and the radiological evaluation. In audiological evaluation, obviously, we start with the basics, that is the tunifolk test, then more to pure tone audiometry, impedance audiometry, static complaints, acoustic reflexes, speech audiometry, and auto-acoustic emissions. So we look at each of this individually. So if you look at tunifolk test, you have Renee's, Weber's, and absolute bone condition. So in uh, stepidial otosclerosis, Renes is negative, that is the bone conduction is better than the air conduction and it is lateralized to the affected ear. And the bone conduction will be normal because there is no sensineural component. But in cochlear otosclerosis, the Renes will be positive because there is sensineural component and the air conduction will be better than the bone conduction. And the lateralization will be to whichever ear hears better. And the absolute bone conduction will be decreased in cochlear otosclerosis. In mixed type where the Stepidial and cochlear otosclerosis involved. The Renes is negative, that is, bone conduction is better than air conduction, and Weber's is lateralized to the better ear, and the absolute bone conduction is decreased. So, these are the pure tone audiograms of two patients that we saw in our institute. As you, one of them is a male, which is more rare than the female, and both of them are in the third and fourth decades of their life. So you can see there is airborne gap in both of these audiograms and both of them have bilateral otosclerosis. So here in, in this patient, you can see a 2K dip, but it's not very classical. So what happens is that we talk about the 2K dip and Kahar's notch. So in why does that happen? So if you actually look at it, all the in the early part of the disease, all the earlier frequency that is 500 and 1000 and 2000 frequencies up to 4000 frequency is generally affected in otosclerosis. So, generally uh, in uh, 500 hertz and 1k hertz, it is around 5 to 10 decibels. The maximum uh, loss is seen at 2k that is around 15 decibels. Again, at 4k, it is around 10 decibels. So, th why this 15 uh, decibel hearing loss only at 2k? So one of the theories is that the resonance of the ossicular chain is maximum at the 2K. So when, and this is, this resonance is what is disrupted with otosclerosis. So that is why at 2K, the dip is maximum, that is up to 15 decibels of hearing loss is seen. But it is not seen in 100% of the patients because depending on what stage of the disease they come in. If they come in very early stage of the disease, we might see, uh, 
uh, hearing loss in the lesser frequency, uh, lesser frequencies, that is 500 and 1K before we see it in 2K, okay? So if it is only cochlear otosclerosis, then we see this kind of audiogram, that is the cookie bite audiogram, which is very classical of otosclerosis. Uh, so impedance audiometry, so we know there are four types of graphs. One is the A, B, C, and AS and AD. So in otosclerosis, what happens? The tympanic membrane will be normal, but the compliance of the ossicular chain is disrupted. So the ossicular chain is not completely disrupted. It is reduced. So the compliance is reduced. It is not as, as compliant as it is in a normal patient. So if we take A, I hope you can see my arrow. So if you take A, the graph is normal. It's that of a normal tympanogram. Okay. So, or if it is very early stage of otosclerosis, it might still be A. But as the foci gets worse and the otosclerotic disease progresses, the complaints will slowly decrease. So only complaints will be decreased. Rest everything will be normal. So you find this kind of graph that is AS type of graph. So the complaints here has decreased. So if we look at what is, uh, if you look at static complaints, static complaint, uh, the normal range is from 0.3 to 1.6, okay? So any patients whose static complaint is less than 0.3 is indicator of some amount of stiffness. But if it is less than 0.2, then we assume and rest of the features are that of autosclerosis, then it is indicative of a thick foot plate. So acoustic reflexes, as we know, will definitely be affected both ipsilateral and then the contralateral in cases of bilateral otosclerosis. But in early stages of the disease, in initial part of the auto, uh, auto acoustic, ref, uh, I mean acoustic reflexes, it can be biphasic. This biphasic pattern is because the anterior part of the foot plate is affected and the posterior part is not. So when we put the probe in and we start the a reflex examination. So the initial part can is and the end part is slightly more compliable than the others. So in early stages of the disease, because the anterior because majority of the people have anterior focus disease, so anterior part of the foot plate is involved. So in those patients, sometimes we can have a biphasic pattern. That is because the anterior part is involved and the posterior part of the foot plate is still compliable. So because of this, we can see the biphasic pattern. Uh, generally, otosclerotic patients have good speech discrimination unless sensorineural component is involved. That is, unless we are also suspecting cochlear or mixed type of otosclerosis or sensorineural component is involved due to some other disease associated with it. And otoacoustic emissions is absent. So now we move on to radiological examination. The most reliable that is present with us today is high resolution CT. So high resolution CT can detect an active foci if it is greater than one mm in size. Okay, so this CT helps us when we are suspecting a cochlear otosclerosis and in post-op follow-up of the patient, both to assess the disease, the progression of the disease, the resolution of the symptoms, as well as the uh, placement of the prosthesis. So an identification of a large cochlear aqueduct in case if you're suspecting a large cochlear aqueduct, then we need to be prepared for a CSF gusher in these patients. And to rule out any differential diagnosis that we might have. So our, the grading of the CT is like three grades. So grade one, grade two, and grade three. So if only a, a fenestral hypotense focus is that, then it is grade one. Grade two can be divided into two A, B, and C. If, the, if it is patchy cochlear disease, and if it's re, uh, involving only the basal turn, then it is 2A. If it is reaching to the apical or the middle turn, then it is 2B. And if it involves around lateral aspect of the basal, middle, and the apical turns, it is 2C. Okay. And if it is diffuse, confluent cochlear involvement, as you can see in the last picture there, then it is grade 3. So a few other radiological investigations are available. So one of them is MRI, but in, MRI, uh, in otosclerotic patients, MRI is not of very significant value. Though in certain sequences, in cases of active disease, it can help, but not of much use for us. The other two are CT densitometry and single photon emission CT. In CT densitometry, what we do is we do take a CT scan, high resolution CT scan, then we scout for the cochlea. Once the cochlea is scouted, we go, uh, six to eight axial cuts above 
and six to eight hour cell cuts below the cochlea. Then we compare the densitometer in each cut and compare that with that of the normal patients. So it will help us in identification of foci in the otic capsule and discern any active or inactive disease and when patients are undergoing fluoride therapy, sodium fluoride therapy that is, it can help us monitor the progress of the patients. So that is the advantage of C CT densitometry. So the other one is single photon emission computer tomography. Basically, it studies the metabolic activity. So generally, it is more sensitive in active phase of the disease than in the inactive phase of the disease. And the sensitivity is around 97.2%. But the biggest disadvantage is so contrast has to be injected. And we have to wait for three to four hours for the contrast to take up in the, and to, for the metabolic activity to be seen in this. Then only the CT scan can be done. So we'll, once we have our diagnosis, then we'll be moving on to our management. So management is three. We have three options. One is the medical management, one is the hearing aids, and one is surgery. So if you are looking at medical management, there's sodium fluoride, bisphosphonates, and cytokine inhibitors. The most commonly and widely used is sodium fluoride. So patients should always be given the option of hearing aid along with surgery. It is the patient's discretion to use hearing aids. Though when the patient uses hearing aids, the disease progression will not be stopped. Patient might have, have improved hearing for some time and then the hearing might still get affected and worsen later on. But it's still an option both for legal and ethical purposes that needs to be offered to the patient. And the other main option that we'll be discussing also in detail today is surgery. In surgery, there is stepidectomy, stepidotomy, and laser stepidotomy. We'll start with the medical treatment. So like it was, sodium fluoride is still the most commonly used medical treatment. So how does sodium fluoride work? So basically it decreases the bone resorption and increases the bone formation. It has an anti-enzymatic action. So basically, as you can see here, it acts on the acid phenylphosphatase enzyme, which is an enzyme of bone resorption. Uh, which is increased in autosclerosis. So with flu uh, fluoride therapy, this enzyme, it decreases. So that decreases bone resorption and increases bone formation. So it, but sodium fluoride can act only if the disease is active. It is not of much use if it is in the second phase, that is the inactive disease. Uh, sodium fluoride also reduces the osteoclastic, uh, osteoclastic activity when the fo focus is active and increases the osteoblastic activity. So basically, the fluoride ion uh, becomes part of the hydroxyapatite and it becomes fluoro uh, fluoroapatite. So fluoroapatite is a much stronger, better and resistant to bone resorption than hydroxyapatite. So the dosage is uh, 50 mg daily. And it can be decreased to 25 mg if the active disease focus has come down significantly or increased up to 75 mg as maximum dosage per day. So indication for fluoride therapy is when we are suspecting stepidial otosclerosis, but it also has sensorineural hearing loss, which is disproportionate to the age the patient presents to us with. Other one is cochlear otosclerosis with family history of otosclerosis. It's an early age onset, audiometric evaluations all go towards otosclerosis and there is good speech discrimination. In those patients, uh, sodium fluoride therapy can be given. Other one is uh, radiological signs are positive, Schwartz sign is positive and uh, otosclerosis with the secondary with high drops. Or if the patient refuses surgery and seeks an alternative form of treatment, then sodium fluoride can be started. So the contraindications are in basically renal patients who have chronic nephritis who already have a nitrogen buildup, then this can cause toxic buildup. So they have to be monitored in case they have to be started on. It's almost contraindicated, never started in these patients. Other one is rheumatoid arthritis patients. This definitely will increase the joint pain. And uh, obviously in children whose skeletal growth has not been achieved and pregnant lactating women and uh, patients who already have skeletal fluorosis or have any allergy to fluoride. So the side effects are early fluorosis in the spine can be a side effect and one is gastritis, gastric disturbance because of the hydroxyfluorine acid in the stomach. It's prevented by NP coating and chronic arthritis. So the other drug is the bisphosphonates. 
uh, biphosphonates. It is an anti-enzymatic action. It reduces the osteoclastic uh, activity and it stabilizes the secondary bone formation. So there are uh, edendronate is the uh, older drug that uh, older bisphosphonate that has been used. It basically halts the progression of the otosclerotic activity. The newer drugs that are used are anendronate, resendronate, and zolendronate. So cytokine uh, inhibitors basically acts on the interleukin one antagonist. So basically, again, halt the bone resorption. That is the osteoclastic activity, and this is also uh, this will also work only in the active phase of the disease. So we spoke about the hearing aid as an alternative that needs to be offered to patients when they are considering surgery. So this can be offered to patients who refuse surgery and also in patients who are not fit for surgery due to other conditions. And if this is the only ear that is functioning and they have a very poor speech discrimination score and inadequate hearing reserve, or if it is very early stage of the disease with early mild conductive hearing loss. And in also patients with congenital fixation of stapes, or there are comorbid conditions associated, that is otosclerosis with Meniere's disease. And also in patients who have already undergone surgery unsuccessfully in the other ear. So this will be basically the only ear that they have left for hearing. In those patients also, hearing aid is an option. So we'll look in detail at the surgical management. So indications for surgical management is when there is unilateral or bilateral otosclerosis with an average bone gap of 40 decibels or more in four frequencies. Okay, And severely declining uh, bone conduction and AB gap of less than 40 decibels or in very advanced otosclerosis where there is fixation of foot plate in tympanosclerosis or congenital anomalies with fixation of foot plate. So there are contraindications for the surgery. One is the relative contraindication is an AV gap less than 40 decibels with normal bone conduction. If the bone conduction is normal and the AV gap is less than 40 decibels, it's a relative contraindication. Also in children, you have to assess if the Chinese surgery at this stage or not. And temporarily in these conditions where wherever there's infection of the external auditory canal or there is a chronic otitis media or a PM perforation, tympanic membrane perforation, it is temporarily avoided till that particular condition is healed. Then you can take up these patients for surgery. Absolute contraindication if this is the only hearing ear. If the previous other ear, previously the other ear was operated and there was a CSF gush and in cochlear otosclerosis. Cochlear otosclerosis is an absolute contraindication for surgery because there's already sense neural component that is involved and only the surgery will not help improve the hearing in the patient. So generally the surgery can, can be done in both local anesthesia and general anesthesia. So the approaches we use is transcanal and n -order. So why local anesthesia? We have certain advantages with local anesthesia. One is we can assess for any vestibular symptoms while doing the surgery. Two, the position of the prosthesis while asking the patient about their hearing can be assessed during the surgery itself and the position of the process can be readjusted accordingly. General anesthesia is definitely more comfortable for the patients and less anxiety and not all patients will be able to tolerate local anesthesia. So we use two approaches. One is the transcanal or endoral. Endoral is generally not required unless there is certain con anatomical conditions. Uh, most of the time, uh, Transcanal approach will suffice. So I'll be showing pictures and I'll be describing the steps of the surgery. So before, uh, obviously, informed written consent, informed verbal consent, and sterile conditions are important following that. So we give local anesthesia, that is 2% uh, lignocaine with adrenaline diluted, 1 is to 10,000 or 1 is to 50,000, and injected in the uh, external auditory canal in all the four quadrants. Once that is done, we take a Rosen's incision and as you can see here, the incision in the first picture, the incision is being taken and then the incision is joined together and the tympanometer flap is being elevated. In this slide, you can see this where my arrow is, that is the cauda tympani now. So when we are elevating the tympanometer flap and reaching the annulus and we're elevating the uh, annulus so that time we will come across the cauda tympani there should be no injury to the nerve no elongation nor stretching of the nerve and here you can see we are entering the middle ear space 
So once we can see the structures of the medulla, that is the incurs incurostepidural joint, and uh, then we start curating the bone so that we'll be able to clearly visualize the incurostepidural joint, the suprastructure of the stapes and the oval window. So we curate as much bone as necessary, which might vary from patient to patient and certain anatomical variations, till we can see the incurostepidural joint, the suprastructure of the stapes and the foot plate. So as we can see, the bone is being curated here. It's being curated where we can, this is a cauda tympani, this is the incurostepidural joint, and this will be the foot plate. As more bone is curated, you can see that in the next few steps. So this is the incurostepidural joint, and this is the suprastructure, and this is the oval, uh, oval window. So after we identify these structures, we protect the cauda tympani, Tympani throughout the entire procedure and we start making the fenestration. So here what is being made is the control fenestration. Generally, the diameter of that is around 3 mm. So once that is done, we, we have to remove the structural structure of the stapes and cut the stapedial tendon. So first what we do is we identify the posterior crux of the stapes, stapes suprastructure and we use a drill and drill out the post, uh, posterior crux. So we don't use saline uh, during this procedure unless we can use physiological saline because we've already made the control fenestration and we don't want anything entering into the perilymph. So once the uh, uh, fenestration uh, is made and the posterior crux is drilled out, as you can see here, then we we palpate for the incurostepidial joint and dislocate the incurostepidial joint. So here the process of dislocation is taking place. And then we cut the stepidial tendon. Once the stepidial tendon is cut, we use a uh, crocodile forceps or any forceps to dislocate the anterior crux and then dislocate the entire suprastructure of the stapes. So this is the dislocated stapes suprastructure that you can see. Here. So then we widen the control fenestration that we made. Uh, up to 0.4 to 0.6, depending on the patient and the uh, autosclerotic foci that is there. So this, what you're seeing here is the measurement of the uh, prosthesis. So here, fluoroplastic prosthesis was used. And generally, the length of the prosthesis is around 4 mm. We add around 0.25 mm for it to go into the vestibule. So around generally, the length of the uh, prosthesis is around 4.2 mm. And the diameter is 0.4. Mm. So once the uh, process is, is reshaped to the length we want, we widen the uh, we wide, widen it and then we place the prosthesis in the fenestration that we made and hook it onto the uh, incus. Once it is hooked onto the incus, then it has to be crimped. So this is the crimping process that you see here that is taking place. So once the fenestration that we have made and we have placed the process now, now the fenestration has to be covered with some tissue. So here what you can see is no touch technique of taking the uh, loose areolar tissue and fat. So postauricularly a small incision is given and the uh, forceps and scissors are used to harvest the uh, loose areolar tissue. So one that is there, here you can see it being placed around the fenestration to cover it. And once the process is done, we can pull back, we, we can replace that uh, flap that we lifted. So for round window seal, there are different materials that can be used. One is the vein, the temporalis fascia, blood, fat, pericondium, or loose areolar tissue. So most of the studies show not too much difference between any of these materials that is used to seal the round window. All of them have more or less the similar results. But with blood, that is the blood clot is used. And in certain cases, if it dissolves, there can be certain issues. So generally, it is not the most preferred. So vein, which generally is harvested from the hand, so uh, it is a separate incision and the separate procedure that is associated with it. People prefer temporal fascia and perichondrium or loose areola tissue because you, uh, you, it can be harvested from the same area that you're already doing the surgery in. So the different processes and processes have evolved. So first one was the Robinson process. You can see in this picture here, it's a bucket handle type. 
so then there was cost teflon fish maggi and house wire some of the different uh, processes are shown here so what we used uh, what we generally use is the fluoroplastic uh, processes so that is also shown here that is f yeah so this is the fluoroplastic process that you saw in the steps that i showed and these processes are generally made of different materials uh, from steel platinum gold teflon or titanium so generally i could told the diameter is around 0.4 mm and the length is 4 mm plus or minus 0.25 mm so this uh, what is tepidectomy and what is tepidotomy so there are certain advantages and disadvantages with both so advantages with stepidectomy is in extensive fixation of the foot plate or there is a floating floating foot plate or comminuted fracture of the foot plate in these conditions going in for a stepidectomy is a better option than to go for a stepidotomy and one more advantage with stepidectomy is in long term follow up of these patients it's been noticed that there is better gain in lower frequencies the hearing gain is better in lower frequencies in patients who have undergone stepidectomy than stepidotomy but uh, the disadvantage is this increased post op uh, complications and vestibular symptoms and higher chance of sensorineural hearing loss uh, in the long term follow up so initially the airborne gap might be decreased and the patient might have better hearing but in the long term most of them were seen to develop sensorineural hearing loss and migration of the processes but if you look at stepidotomy its advantage is that even in obliterative uh, otosclerosis obliterated foot plate it causes less trauma to the vestibule and there is decreased inc in incidence of processes migration decreased incidence of fixation and high the, there is a better high frequency gain in stepidectomy there was a better gain in low frequencies in stepidotomy there is better gain in high frequencies and better post op speech discrimination uh, initially it used to be technically more difficult and uh, the closure of airborne gap in long follow up of the patient is better in stepidectomy than in stepidotomy so one of the latest advancement is the use of lasers to make the fenestration and carry out certain steps in the surgery so there are two types of lasers one is the visible laser and the invisible lasers so visible lasers ktp is more commonly used and in invisible lasers we use carbon dioxide so what we look for when we are picking a laser is if it has precise optics if it has better vaporization thermal footprint should not be deep that is the thermal damage the heat should not be conducted to the perilymph for the inner ear so if the heat is conducted much deeper then the these structures can be uh, uh, damaged and there can be sensitivity hearing loss so we choose lasers based on these properties so most commonly used is ktp and carbon dioxide laser the disadvantage with carbon dioxide laser is you need an aiming beam a uh, visible light along with it and uh, the setup might be bigger in certain cases but with more recent development in technology that is not a problem anymore but carbon dioxide is preferred because of its uh, better vaporization and it does not uh, heat the perilymph and thermal footprint is much less for carbon dioxide laser that is why it is preferred more uh, so uh, we'll move on to the last part that is the complications that is associated with otosclerosis surgeries so intraoperatively we can encounter an obliterative otosclerosis we can there can be fixation of the ossicular chain that is the incus or the malleus or both there can be an overhang of the facial nerve there can be a floating floating foot plate csf gusher uh, there can be a tear in the tympanic membrane and a persistent stepidial atrophy so if we look at obliterative otosclerosis we go ahead with the same procedure that was described but while making the fenestration we might use a drill but when we are using the drill we have to keep because we don't know the depth up to which we have to go so we have to keep checking the surrounding uh, bone uh, thickness to keep evaluating to what depth we are drilling that is why you have to be careful in obliterative otosclerosis uh, when it comes to fixation of the ossicular chain if it is a fixation of the incus uh, then there can be uh, another option that is the processes can be different that is san uh, sama processes that is a 6 mm processes that can be used and it can be attached to the malleus but if there is fixation of both incus and the malleus 
then the incus is removed the head of the malleus is removed and uh, the incus can be reshaped or the summer process can be used and it can be attached but generally the procedure is carried out only by extremely skilled uh, surgeons who have done a lot of such cases otherwise it's a very difficult procedure to attempt with a uh, lot of complications so another uh, complication that can be there is the facial nerve overhang so in case if there is a facial nerve overhang then the inferior bony edge of the oval window on the promontory is carefully drilled out uh, and then the fenestra is made inferiorly to the uh, promontory okay so oval window the bony inferior bony edge of the oval window of the promontory is carefully drilled out if there is a facial nerve to avoid any damage to the facial nerve and the fenestra is also made more inferiorly uh, but if there is a, a floating foot plate then there are two options one is if you can uh, is to not make the situation worse the foot plate is not supposed to fall deeper into the uh, vestibule uh, and one, if we can remove the uh, uh, foot plate and do a stepidectomy, we can go ahead with it. Or the foot plate has to be lifted up and then fixed, and then the rest of the procedure or the posterior uh, foot plate can be, uh, if it is not affected, can be left pain, anterior can be removed, and we can continue with the procedure. So, uh, perilim puncture or CSF gusher, uh, if it is there, we can wait for a few minutes first for the gush to stop. So this will be an intense gush suddenly as soon as the drilling is done. And uh, generally, if this complication is there, there's a high chance the patient will develop sensineural hearing loss. So once we wait for it to stop, we can use both fat and perichondrium and close the uh, fenestration that was made and use fibrin glow and come out. Generally, the procedure is not carried out further because of your of even worsening the sensitivity hearing loss that this patient might have. If there is a tympanic membrane tear, then we look at the size of the tear. If it is less than 3 mm, then we can use fat, perichondrium, or uh, temporalis fascia uh, and uh, cover the tear that is there. But if the tear is greater than 3 mm, then we generally don't go ahead with the procedure. We do a myringoplasty and come out and then do the procedure as a second stage when the tympanic membrane has completely healed. So in case of perilymph, uh, per persistent stepidial artery, uh, like we know stepidial artery is a branch of internal carotid artery. It generally degenerates about seven weeks. Uh, but in certain patients, it can be persistent. If it is persistent, we see it as a remnant in the anterior part of the foot plate. Uh, and it's seen in around one in 5,000 to one in 10,000 of the patients. Uh, and it's generally seen between both the crura. In those cases, you have to be extremely careful when you're carrying out the drilling of the uh, and removal of the superstructure. Uh, Postoperatively, if there were certain complications like uh, perilymph gusher, and uh, if you intraoperatively, if you suspect popular otosclerosis, or if there's obliterative otosclerosis involving the round window, then the patient can have sensineural hearing loss or if the length of the process is more, uh, displacement of the process can also cause sensineural hearing loss. Uh, vestibular symptoms in majority of the patients is only for a smaller period of time, but if it's persistent, then we have to do an imaging to see where the process is and if the length of the process is inappropriate for this particular patient, and it has to be evaluated and taken up from there. Uh, if the, like I told at the start, when uh, of the surgical procedure, corda tympani nerve has to be preferred, uh, preserved in this procedure. If there is any elongation or there is any damage to the corda tympani, the patient can have metallic taste or no taste at all. So dysgeusia and agusia can be there in these patients. If there is facial nerve overhang or facial nerve, uh, facial canal dehiscence and there was any damage to the facial nerve, facial paralysis can be there. This has to be addressed as soon as we find the symptoms both intraoperatively or in immediate postoperative, these symptoms are there. These have to be addressed immediately. So in certain patients, uh, the 
processes can act as a foreign body and there can be post operative reparative granuloma which is extensive granuloma covering the entire processes and majority of the middle ear it will be generally seen within 2 weeks of the surgery only in certain cases can it be seen much later in these cases you have to uh, reoperate on the patient and the entire granuloma is to be rem uh, removed and majority of the time the process also needs to be removed and there is uh, some chance of cholestatoma formation uh, further down the lane in certain patients thank you i hope this covered some of the basics of photosclerosis and gave at least a broad view uh, we can take any questions that anyone has